I'm an odd man out here from every uh, perspective because I'm a lawyer. I'm not an engineer. So, so to introduce what we do, uh, my name is Biju Nair. Uh, I run a law firm called Legalitech, where we work on open source from a policy perspective, from a compliance perspective, from an audit perspective, and also enforcing the open source licenses. So we do all this spectrum of work. So today we will look into what is the global regulatory framework around software bill of material. We have various wonderful discussion around the technical aspects. Now let's see whether what is the mandate of the law, not just in India, globally. Also we'll see sectoral regulation. So now we will understand why this is also required from a regulatory perspective because if you don't do this, there is fine, there could be audit, there could be embarrassment, there could be cybersecurity risk, there could be data breaches, and all those things. So briefly about what we do, and uh, yeah, this disclaimer is very important because this is not a legal advice. Now let's go into briefly about software bill of material, one liner. What is a software bill of material? If I ask you a layman like me, if I have a cookie, I know the ingredient list of my uh, cookie. The same way, if in a software, I need to know the ingredient list from various perspectives. Because one, there could be vulnerability. Other, there could be what is the license involved? Which version of uh, the software is involved? So all those things is needed from the spot software perspective. So let's look into what is the history of bill of material. This bill of material concept comes from the automobile sector because there are tons of vendors and you know, how do you uh, manage all the vendors, the whole supply chain. So software bill of material also comes from, the bill of material comes from that uh, automotive era. Now let's look into what are the benefits. So today I'll be focusing both from the CERT, which is the Computer Emergency Response Team, which is the cybersecurity arm of the METI, Government of India. They have come out with a guideline. And what have they looked into? What is the benefit of having a software material? Enhanced security management, effective incident response, <clears throat> vulnerability identification and patch management, supply chain security, assisting ensuring compliance, improved operational efficiency. So broadly, we will get into some of the details with some use cases. So let's say security management, I can talk about one good uh, example, Equifax, which is one of the largest uh, US-based credit trading agency. They were uh, using Apache Structs. So when they used Apache Structs, there was some vulnerability they did not fix the patch. Initially, they blamed Apache Foundation. Oh, it's not our problem. It's their problem. Then they realized that they did not fix the patch. There was a huge data breach. They were fined badly. So what happens in the end of the day? You have to still do compliance. You have to do still incident management. So from various perspectives, software bill of material is important. So look it from a data production perspective. Look it from a breach perspective, look it from a non-compliance perspective, because just think of the fine your company or your organization has to pay if there's a data breach. Look at the reputational damage. So all are, these are the consequences of not having a software bill of material. So uh, let's talk about ensuring compliance. So during the COVID times, what I was doing was, I was sending legal notices to banks and financial institutions in India. Because they were using my client's library, which helped them in uh, uh, producing PDF and security on top of it. But what they, my, uh, the users, the banks and financial institutions or their system integrators did not do was to look into the license. It was under AGPL license, which mandated that they have to release the source code. Being a bank or a financial institution, they can't release the source code. As simple as that. But they were using my client's library, which was under AGPL license. The other option they had was take a license from us, which is paid. 
So they did not do the uh, you know check. So it should be ideally be done by your procurement team. That's why in compliance, it is not just the legal team which is involved. It is your license, uh, uh, you know, procurement team, your uh, sales and marketing guys. Everybody should be involved. It is not one team's responsibility. So now look into the supply chain's perspective. Today, like whether you are in whichever sector you are in, you would have seen you have vendors from across the globe, tier one vendors, tier two vendors, tier three vendors. They don't know about software bill of material. But can you say in a court of law, if you're sued, that, oh, I did not know this. You know, ignorance of law is not an excuse. So it is very important that each of us in the complete supply chain, we are aware about it. If our vendors are not aware about it, but we'll be finally liable. Because let's say tomorrow you buy a car. OK? You will sue the car manufacturer. You will not know the ultimate vendor who was providing that particular software in that case. So it is very important that you map the whole supply chain and inform, educate, and create awareness in the whole supply chain. Otherwise, there will be a problem for you. Now let's look in from other perspectives from a legal perspective. Let's say you are uh, supplying, you are a vendor, and uh, under the IT Act, Information Technology Act, you have to take best measures, not just in the Indian IT Act, whether it is GDPR, whether it is any data protection regulation across the globe, you have to take best measures to do compliance. So if you have not done a basic thing as having a software bill of material, which gives you the whole roadmap of what is contained in your uh, you know, supply, supply chain, then what have you done? You have not done the basic essential work, which was the onus is on you. So from, a, from that perspective now, let's get into the global roadmap. So you will see, so this gives you a global perspective, both uh, sectoral, this also gives country-wise regulation. So whether it is the US uh, EU executive order, which is 14028, which came from the Biden administration, because US saw a lot of uh, problems like this case or many other uh, you know vulnerability issues so they came up with this the U european uh, cyber resilience act this also mandates it us and ntia which also talks about the elements of uh, software bill of material this is the german law bsi so here you will also find sectoral laws like the medical devices for M uh, fda requires software bill of material uh, so this is the japanese law which mandates software bill of material uh, sectoral, like IM, DRF, the PCI uh, guidelines, automotive sector. So here you will also find which are the various formats. So XPDX uh, also has been now uh, accepted as an ISO standard. Uh, that is one advantage, XPDX 3.1, which is an accepted as an ISO standard. Obviously, you have also Cyclone DX format. Here you can talk, also see that you know, various sectoral uh, you know, com committees also have uh, software bill of material, which is mandated. So this is a broader perspective. Now let's also look into uh, this in more detail. So as we already spoke about most of this, you know, you'll also find the, uh, you know, uh, sectoral wise, credit uh, sector, medical devices sector, automotive sector. So the objective of this slide is to showcase that irrespective of the sector you are in, broadly either the software bill of material has become a mandate or it has become a mandate in your general guidelines in the country or this is going to come very frequent, very soon. So with that, now let's look into the Indian situation. Or before that, you know, this is just an example of what and all an XPDX example of software bill of material contains. So you will see the version number, you will see the package number, all those details which would be important for you. Component number, uh, you know, name, timestamp information, all this information. This is just on a broader level. 
I will not dwell deep into this because I think by the end of the day, most of the you know, speakers have covered all these issues. Uh, yeah. So, U.S. executive order. So, it mandates that any software sold to the U.S. federal government must be accompanied by a software bill of material. So, it applies to any supplier of products and services. EU Cyber Resilience Act, applicability, man manufacturers of digital products selling in Europe, okay, and uh, to have a software bill of material. I'll just uh, now move into the third cybersecurity uh, requirement. This is, this is not mandatory, this is a guideline. So it is up to you to follow this. But as I told you earlier, under the IT Act and other global da uh, data production rules, it says that you have to take all measures possible to ensure there is data protection. So this also could cons be considered as a basic minimum requirement for data protection. Now, uh, let's move forward. Okay. So they talk about all these uh, things in the uh, CERT Cyber uh, Software Bill of Material. So now let's look into this problems in this uh, CERT Software Bill of Material. This is just a technical recommendation. But mind you, within three months of this uh, technical recommendation, we got these SEBI's directions for regulated entities. So this became the framework for other regulators to adopt. And there is no timeline or for organizations to adopt software bill of material. So these are the, some of the shortcomings of the uh, CERT cyber, uh, software bill of material guidelines. Now let's look into the specific sector, which is the SEBI's, uh, it's called this latest circular. It is on cyber, cyber security and cyber resilience framework. So this now mandates any SEBI regulated entity to have a software bill of material. And they also provide a timeline. So in the CERT, there is no timeline, it is not mandatory, but this is mandatory. Here, for the CERT, uh, uh, SEBI's regulated entities, this is a mandate. So it is mandated for all critical systems and software components of SEBI entities, including mandatory inclusion in periodic cybersecurity audits, aimed to address risk of harvest now, decrypt later attacks, ensuring robust tracking of dependencies and vulnerabilities. So, you see time limit here, okay? So what and all you have to do? Real-time maintenance of software material for all updates, patches, and installations. Periodic risk assessment using software bill of material to identify software vulnerabilities. Submission of software bill of material findings in structured audit reports. So if you are uh, an existing entity, by January 1st, 2025, you have to give this report to SEBI. And it is April 1st if you are a newly regulated entity. What is the consequence? SEBI can impose fine. It can put operational restrictions. It can uh, do license cancellation. You can't do any op operation. You, you, there could be a forensic audit by SEBI, penalty, and there could be reputational damage. So it's not just ac across the globe. Even in India, sectoral regulators could and SEBI is a good example of what are the consequences of not having a software bill of material. So I, I think after this, maybe we can expect RBI and other regulators or IRDA to come up with, you know, mandating software bill of material. So with that, thank you. Any questions?